Hello everyone, my name is Bradley and this is SumSub, your detailed guide on how to survive in the online jungle. Now, in many of my videos, I've talked repeatedly about how fraudsters steal your bank details with the help of phishing sites, clever skimmers, or simple telephone conversations. But today, we're going to talk about instances of when criminals use their own cards to commit fraud. Now, similar to the military term friendly fire, this type of crime is called friendly fraud. But there's really nothing friendly about it at all. I mean, in a friendly fire situation, soldiers mistakenly kill their own allies. Friendly fraud means that ordinary buyers become criminals, sometimes intentionally, but sometimes because they're not even aware of what they're really doing. So are you sure that your bank does not suspect you of fraud? But before we talk about this kind of fraud itself, let's tackle one important concept, chargeback. Now, this is the name of the procedure for cancelling an already made payment for, let's say, a product or service. With the mass introduction of credit cards, the need for chargeback became quite apparent. Hey world, who do you take traveling? MasterCard and me. Now, when paying in cash, the buyer can usually immediately evaluate what he or she was buying. If the quality of the goods was in doubt, you could just immediately cancel the transaction. You return the purchase and, well, get your money back. So in the case of using debit or credit cards, everything's much more complicated because of the intermediary between you and the bank or the seller, right? And the seller can't immediately return the funds to you, even if they agree with the claim. Additionally, there's the risk of, say, erroneous transactions. For instance, the double debiting of funds. So this is ultimately why cashless payments are always less attractive than <laughs> the use of good old cash, right? And therefore, in 1974, American banks lobbied for the Fair Credit Billing Act. Now, according to this new law, a dissatisfied buyer could contact his bank and demand the cancellation of some payment. The bank would study the circumstances surrounding the transaction, conduct its own investigation and due diligence, and either return the money to the client or give a reasoned refusal. Therefore, in pursuit of a good reputation, banks increasingly began to side with the customers. Now, of course, very quickly, there were people who noticed the vulnerabilities in the system. The very possibility of being able to buy something and then have the money returned became a reason for the appearance of chargeback fraud in the first place, or as we're uh, explaining this, friendly fraud. So let's take a look at some chargeback statistics and try to separate the honest customers from the scammers. According to Expert Market, almost 30% of such requests are related to stolen cards. Now, here, the things are pretty straightforward. Among such appeals, you're unlikely to find many instances of friendly scammers. With a card stolen from your pocket, it's not that simple to withdraw cash, right? Of course, attackers can always try to catch sight of your pin code in advance, but this is really no easy task. Besides, then the criminals will have to be standing next to you. And therefore, if the card is immediately used to withdraw cash at, say, the nearest ATM, then the bank security service will definitely have some questions for you, and perhaps they could even analyze CCTV of, say, who was standing next to you in those instances. And therefore, withdrawing money from your card and then reporting it as stolen is a one-way ticket to jail without passing go. Now, a more attractive option is the possibility of withdrawing funds in a series of small payments that do not require additional authorization. However, such unusual activity will surely attract the attention of your bank security programs and payments will be blocked, so you won't have anything to dispute there. So this is also an unsuitable option for friendly scammers. Some problems will also arise if you first go on, say, an online shopping spree and then report that your card has been stolen. Namely, the delivery address will give the game away. Ordinary scammers might use fake recipients, but this only makes sense when you've got a constant stream of criminal purchases. If you have a database of the card details of 700 people, then the idea will pay off. But if you have your own credit cards, which regularly go missing, this will only raise questions, I suppose, from the bank security service. So among the numerous applications for card theft, we're unlikely to find a significant number of friendly scammers. Here, it's worth looking for traces of carders, social engineering specialists, or phishing. That is, those who actually steal card data and use it without your knowledge. The second most popular reason for requesting chargebacks is the lack of goods or services. This is simple. Let's say you've made an advance payment, but you haven't received anything in return. In fact, 
There can be many reasons for this, from the mistake of the manager, who let's say incorrectly processed your order, to actual problems with the logistics company. And it's pretty easy to prove that you haven't had your house renovated or received the lawnmower you ordered, so you just make an application to the bank for a refund. In order for the payment to remain in force, well, your opponent will have to prove that he or she has fulfilled their obligations. For example, they'll provide, let's say, a receipt of prepares or proof of postage with a shipping company. And if they fail to prove their case, the money will return to you. This provides some opportunities for friendly scammers, but there aren't many here. In the modern world, it's almost impossible to actually deliver goods or do some work without leaving any trace. And therefore, in order to find the heroes of today's video, we need to dig a little bit deeper. Now, in third place among the reasons for chargebacks comes the unsatisfactory quality of a product or service. 15% of all chargeback claims are due to this. So let's take a closer look at some of these statements. At least once, we've all bought something that was a little, well, dissatisfactory when it arrived in the post. Let's say disappointing, right? And wish, I'm looking at you. But anyway, it's worth noting that in this case, you have received the order, and it's probably documented too. But now you just don't want to pay for it. Now let's say the size of the jacket you bought wasn't quite right, or you didn't like the color of that hair dye. Well, it would be logical to try and solve this problem directly with the seller, right? But now, only one out of every 20 people actually does this. The remaining 19, well, they open dispute at the bank and demand a refund from them. But why? Well, firstly, it's much easier this way. There's no need to deal with applications and refund forms for each specific seller. There's just one universal form that you fill out at your bank, and it's suitable for returning money for both a baseball cap and for a car. And according to statistics, 40% of those who applied for a refund will do it again within two months. And secondly, it's a lot faster. Most often, even before a detailed examination of the application has been carried out, the money is already returned to the buyer's account. Now, automatically, the seller has to undergo a long dispute process, right? And besides, almost half of the customers don't actually fully understand how the chargeback mechanism itself works. They just want to get their money back as soon as possible. From a formal point of view, such requests for chargebacks are not entirely legal. Now, cardholders don't really think about whether their reasons for claiming a chargeback are actually valid. You need to remember that in a lot of statements, customers, they're not completely honest about the reasons for their refund. And this is actually classified as perjury. Thirdly, often in disputed cases, the goods cannot actually be returned. With a well-presented claim, the seller doesn't actually have a great chance of proving his case at all. If the seller is also found guilty, he is forced to pay all of the costs associated with the investigation, the bank fees, and also the fines. And if claims arise regularly, well, the bank may actually refuse to work with the company altogether. Only very large stores can afford to organize the return of rejected goods, ensure their repackaging and sale. Amazon and everybody else is constantly trying to you know, enhance that user experience and figure out how do you best do that. Uh, but you still have the reverse shipping, you have to pay for that shipping to go back, um, you have to deal with the item itself, how do you file it away, how do you deal with it. And it's much easier for small producers to just write off such goods immediately. This is actually what friendly scammers can tap into. Their activities actually only differ from shoplifters in the fact that they don't actually have to leave the house to steal goods. And they're not really worried about the fact that the seller will lose much more than the amount stated on the receipt. You need to remember that on average, for every dollar of goods appropriated by fraudsters, well, that results in a loss of $2.5 for the seller. But maybe you're not really impressed by these figures. So I'll put it in different terms. In 2020, experts estimated the volume of activity of friendly scammers at $4.8 billion, which means that the seller's losses amounted to more than $10 billion. Additionally, in recent years, a new reason for requesting refunds has emerged, an accidental subscription to interactive services. Now, surely you've seen these ads for online streaming services that maybe offer the first month for like a discounted price or even free, right? But then after the advertising period, the subscription fee will come into play, or maybe it will be 15 to 20 times the original charge. This sort of price is unlikely to appeal to a person who is used to receiving a fully-fledged service almost for free. Moreover, we rarely read all of the terms and conditions. It would be, well, it would take a huge amount of time, right? 
The Norwegian Consumer Council has actually calculated that it will take you about an hour to read all of the rules for using Facebook, almost two hours for LinkedIn, and iTunes' terms of use will take more than three hours to read. Who has that time? And particularly vulnerable to such things are our children. Now, a couple of years ago, Amazon's finances agreed to return more than $70 million to its users. Why? Well, young children made purchases for this amount. And they used their parents' devices and made small purchases all without their consent. Now, as a rule, such transactions are quite small. But in total, on average, more than $100 can be spent actually by each child over the course of some time. Now, all of these transactions were contested because the real cardholders didn't actually give their informed consent to purchases on Amazon. In these cases, the children didn't try to deceive the internet company, but they deceived their parents by spending the money without their permission. But perhaps this is the most difficult type of friendly fraud to calculate. The only thing really that comes to mind is the creation of individual user profiles, which will track the behavior and interests of each person in the system. If, I don't know, you've got a subscription to say the Wall Street Journal, and you know, this is the only thing you pay for, and then suddenly you, know, you spend about $100 playing Candy Crush, it doesn't quite add up, right? But if you're into those online games, you know, then it's a different story. Now, without waiting for favors from online stores and banks, there is actually something parents can do to take financial security of their families. Now, feel free to use parental controls on your kids' phones for a start. Get a separate physical or virtual bank cards. Also pay for subscriptions for online services and games. And also check the statements on this card regularly. It'll help you notice in time that your hard-earned dollars are slowly being turned into Robux. According to Makata Advisory Group, losses from friendly fraud in 2020 exceeded $50 billion. And on average, this figure increases by 20% every single year. I wouldn't be surprised if in a few years we forget about all these old methods and we'll actually be carefully studying and classifying new types of friendly scammers. I mean, this stuff is changing all the time. But anyway, I don't think this is the last time that cyber criminals are going to be surprising me. But who is me? I am Bradley. And I do solemnly swear that I am not a chargeback fraudster. The big question is, are you? In any case, chargeback fraudster or not, I will see you lovely people in our next video. Thanks for joining us.